Broadcasting to Southeast Wisconsin at 5.40 a.m. What the main sections of the civil rights movement in the United States are saying is that the demand for dignity, equality, jobs, and citizenship will not be abandoned or diluted or postponed. If that means resistance and conflict, we shall not flinch. We shall not be cowed. We are no longer afraid. The word that symbolizes the spirit and the outward form of our encounter is nonviolence. And it is doubtless that factor which made it seem appropriate to award a peace prize to one identified with struggle. Broadly speaking, nonviolence in the civil rights struggle has meant not relying on arms and weapons for struggle. It has meant non-cooperation with customs and laws which are institutional aspects of a regime of discrimination and ensla enslavement. It has meant direct participation of masses in protest rather than reliance on indirect methods, which frequently do not involve masses in action at all. Nonviolence has also meant that my people in the agonizing struggles of recent years have taken suffering upon themselves instead of inflicting it on others. It has meant, as I said, that we are no longer afraid and coward. But in some substantial degree, it has meant that we do not want to instill fear in others or into the society of which we are a part. The movement does not seek to liberate Negroes at the expense of the humiliation and enslavement of whites. It seeks no victory over anyone. It seeks to liberate American society and to share in the self-liberation of all the people. Violence as a way of achieving racial justice is, I am convinced, both impractical and immoral. I am not unmindful of the fact that violence often brings about momentary results. Nations have frequently won their independence in battle, but in spite of temporary victories, violence never brings permanent peace. It solves no social problems. It merely creates new and more complicated ones. Violence is impractical, impractical because it is a descending spiral, ending in destruction for all. It is immoral because it seeks to humiliate the opponent rather than win his understanding. It seeks to annihilate rather than convert. Violence is immoral because it thrives on hatred rather than love. It destroys community and makes brotherhood impossible. It leaves society in monologue rather than dialogue. Violence ends up defeating itself. It creates bitterness in the survivors and brutality in the destroyers. In a real sense, nonviolence seeks to redeem the spiritual and moral lag that I spoke of earlier as the chief dilemma of modern man. It seeks to secure moral ends through moral means. Nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon. Indeed, it is a weapon unique in history, which cuts without wounding and ennobles a man who wills it. I believe in this method because I think it is the only way to reestablish a broken community. It is a method which seeks to implement the just law by appealing to the conscience of the great decent majority who through blindness, fear, pride, and irrationality have allowed their consciences to sleep. The nonviolent resistors can summarize our message in the following simple terms. We will take direct action against injustice. Despite the failure of governmental and other official agencies to act first, we will not obey unjust laws or submit to unjust practices. We will do this peacefully, openly, cheerfully, because our aim is to persuade. We adopt the means of nonviolence because our end is a community at peace with itself. We will try to persuade with our words. But if our words fail, we will try to persuade with our acts. 
We will always be willing to talk and seek fair compromise, but we are ready to suffer when necessary and even risk our lives in order to become witnesses to truth as we see it. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Martin Luther King Jr. on December 11th, 1964, as he was accepting the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, Norway. Um, this is the Maggie Dawn Show on the Civic Media Radio Network. I don't want to over talk um, what Dr. King was sharing with us there, um, but it certainly are prophetic and profound words on this day and in this moment so many, many, many years later. There are a few portions of that excerpt of a longer speech that I think bear emphasis. And if you would indulge me, <clears throat> I'd like to point them out because I think it truly speaks to our time and also speaks a bit to what um, I think our greatest aspiration here, Anya and I, our greatest aspiration on this show and also of Civic Media Network. Um, he's obviously talking about a nonviolence as a, a strategy to achieve social change. And he, he goes through a number of rationales for why nonviolence is, is the key to resisting unjust laws. And there's so much that speaks to me, and I hope spoke to you as we were listening together to what Dr. King said. If you want to tell me anything about your impressions, please don't hesitate to call or text 844-967-2789. That's 844-967-2789. But to me, when I and I read the transcript of it and took a listen a couple of times to see what really was resonating with me. And it's towards the end of that excerpt that I, I really almost got choked up the first time I was listening to what Dr. King said those years ago in Norway. He was explaining, again, the rationale for using nonviolence to achieve social change and to resist oppression. And he points out that nonviolence is the only way to reestablish a broken community. It seeks to redeem the spiritual and moral lag. It seeks to secure moral ends through moral means. It is both powerful and just. It is a weapon unique in history, which cuts without wounding and ennobles the man and women who wield it. But it was perhaps this line of that excerpt that, that I think is the most poignant today. Nonviolence is the method which seeks to implement the just law by appealing to the conscience of the great, decent majority who through blindness, fear, pride, and irrationality have allowed their conscious consciences to sleep. I don't know that there is any group of words that, that really captures the moment that we find ourselves in, in American politics. And what I hope all of us were hearing, no matter what side of the political spectrum we may come from or, or think we are at at this moment, is that when you challenge oppression, the only just and moral tool to do so is through nonviolence. And so when we think back on the events in January, four years ago, when we think about the elections that are coming up, I ask all of us to try to rise to those ideals. If you feel oppressed, to engage in nonviolence, that is our democratic ideal. It is one that we all can share. It is our peaceful transfer of power, our engaging with our voices and our minds to be heard, to challenge one another. This is how change and progress happens. And I was even more 
uh, inspired by this because of what he then says about how we go about nonviolent resistance and action. We do this through direct action against injustice, despite the failure of government to act first. We refuse to obey just unjust laws or to submit to unjust practices. And we do this peacefully, openly, and cheerfully because our aim is to persuade. We adopt the means of nonviolence because our end is a community at peace with itself. We will try to persuade with our words, but if our words fail, we will try to persuade with our acts, and we will always be willing to talk and seek fair compromise. And we are ready to suffer when necessary and even risk our lives to become witnesses to truth as we see it. My name is Maggie Dawn. You are listening to The Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network on this 2024's National Observation of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Powerful words indeed, inspiring. They were to me. I hope you found them as well. My thanks to my producer extraordinaire, Anya Esther, for getting that incredible sound. Now, before we go to break, we're going to take a listen um, to an interview. If we've got, are we going to be able to squeeze that in, I think? Why don't we go ahead? This is October 27th, 1957 in Montgomery, Alabama. Again, more from Martin Luther King Jr. Now, the other method that one might use is that of resignation, or acquiescence. But I think that is just as bad as violence because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. You make a difference, a distinction between passive resistance and nonviolent resistance, is that it? Well, I, I think that can be something of a semantical problem. Uh, if passive resistance means uh, just passively accepting violence or injustice, if it means uh, cowardice and stagnant passivity, then there is a difference because nonviolent resistance th does resist. It is dynamically active. It is passive uh, physically, but it is strongly active spiritually. In a sense, uh, would, you, would you regard it as moving into the Christian philosophy too? You mean the doctrine of turn the other cheek to regard as positive rather than passive? I think it is positive. I think uh, very definitely if it is used properly and accepted with a proper attitude, it is a very strong method. It is a method of the strong man, not the weak man. I was born by the river in a little tin and just like a river I've been running ever since it's been a long long time coming but I know change gonna Yes, it will. It's been so hard living. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Maggie Dawn. She's Anya Esther. You are listening to the Maggie Dawn Show on the Civic Media Radio Network. Happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day, everybody. I hope you've been safe and warm out there. Quite the deep freeze that the entire country seems to find itself in. In this moment, if you want to give us a call and join our conversation this afternoon, go ahead, 844-967-2789. But you can always do it much easily, much more easily. If you go get the Civic Media app, you can take us everywhere you want to go. It's free from your favorite app store for either your Apple or Android device. At the bottom of the hour, we're going to be joined by outgoing Milwaukee County District Attorney John Chisholm. Can't wait to talk with my good friend John, hear his reasons for leaving at this moment, hear what he thinks the election is gearing up to be. I think it's going to be quite a bruiser um, and <laughs> very extremely important. And I think John's perspective on the job that he's been doing 
for nearly 30 years. And frankly, you get it from all sides. You get it from the left, you get it from the right, and you get it from the middle as well. Um, speaks, again, to this moment that we find ourselves in. But returning for now to, I just think, some incredibly powerful words from Dr. Martin Luther King. The last clip that you listened to before the break was an interview, interestingly enough, between Martin Luther King Jr. and Martin Agronsky, who won the Peabody in 1952. He's basically considered the father of political talk shows, um, which is so interesting, right, considering uh, we're doing a political talk show right now, and we have to thank the grandfather of that that new format, uh, Mr. Agronsky. He won the Peabody in 1952 because he really held no punches, pulled no punches when he went after Senator Joseph McCarthy during the peak of McCarthyism. Again, the historical echoes into our present moment just jump right off the audio and right off the transcript pages. From that last bit, I wanted to emphasize um, when Mr. Agronsky, Agronsky asks him um, about the Christian doctrine of turning the other cheek and is drawing an analogy between uh, uh, that Christian concept in the New Testament and Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolent resistance, um, I think Dr. King's response is so incredibly profound because he says that this doctrine, whether we call it turning the other cheek or nonviolent resistance to oppression, um, is the method of the strong, of the strong man, not the weak man. And Wow. Right? Wow. No matter what side of the aisle you're on, he's saying there are tools and tactics that actually help elevate. And it is rooted in nonviolence. It is rooted in persuasion. And those are the tools of the strong. That, yes, there may be suffering. But these are the tactics, the methods for social and political change of the strong. I wonder if the former president would agree. I wonder if those that showed up on January 6th and tried to stop our country's peaceful transfer power, I wonder if they would agree. Can we not hearken back to these words in this time and draw some inspiration, some reminders to all of us that it is only through engaging in discourse, through disagreement, through discussion, that we will break through to achieve, in Dr. King's words, dignity, equality, jobs, and citizenship. Yes, indeed for all. Don from Milwaukee, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to go to you, but if you do call back, happy to take your call. A couple of programming notes before we go to the bottom of the hour break. Um, on January 18th, this coming Thursday, we're going to be joined by one of our very own, Jimmy, who is one of our educational whizzes here at Civic Media, has been um, attending this week the annual educators conference and policy discussion. We're going to have Jimmy on this Thursday to talk about what he's hearing and seeing and, and observing at that big convention this week. So that's super exciting. Uh, January 23rd, I'm going to be joined again by Princeton professor of sociology, Catherine Eden. And then on January 24th, I'm going to be joined by uh, my friend, former colleague, immigrant lawyer, and all-around wonderful person, Joanna Frachek, to share her family's immigration story. I think it's so important to hear from those people um, who have come to the United States in search of the promise that we should be guaranteeing to all of us, uh, not just the select few, the white, the powerful, the rich, the billionaire donor class. Nope, that's not what we do here. Opportunities for all. So you're not going to want to miss hearing from Joanna on January 24th. Really, really 
excited about the Packers as well. I cannot believe it. And I've got a special treat for all of you Civic Media fans. If you would like to see me delving into the minutia of play-by-play calling for a Packers game, I will be doing a personal appearance this coming Saturday at Linneman's River West Lounge. That is 1000 East Locust Street to do a bit of color commentary and play-by-play for the Packers' next playoff game against the 49ers, which will be Saturday afternoon at about 7.30 coming up. Uh, By tomorrow, at the very latest, we should know if and where any of our civic media network stations will be carrying the game as well. But if you want to see me cracking some jokes, making fun of my good friend, current City of Milwaukee budget director Nick Komak, and my former producer Keith Gostad from the Wayback Machine, you're going to not want to miss it at Linneman's River West Lounge, 1000 East Locust, next Saturday evening for the Packers 49ers game. We're going to be going to some important messages in just a moment. Now we're going to be joined, I hope, by my dear friend and outgoing Milwaukee County District Attorney John Chisholm. It's going to be a great conversation. You're not going to want to miss it, so keep it locked here on the Civic Media Radio Network. Oh, yes, it's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. Everybody, I'm Maggie Dawn. She's Anya Esther. You are listening to the Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. Respect indeed, because I've got buckets of it for you. My next guest, current Milwaukee County District Attorney John Chisholm. Thanks so much for joining us on this very cold afternoon, John. Such a pleasure to have you. Well, it's an honor to be here, Maggie. I hope you're staying warm. And uh, as you mentioned, we're we're both prepared in case the, the heating goes out. Uh, we've got our our layers our, of clothing, our matching hoodies. John's making reference to the fact that you can always watch the show and not just listen to it on both our Facebook stream and on YouTube. John and I are sporting our very stylish MLK Day hoodies, not our usual getups. <laughs> Usually, when I see you, we're we're in our monkey suits conducting some county business. John, congratulations on your upcoming retirement. Pretty much shocked. The entire Milwaukee legal uh, legal insiders when you announced your retirement just after the holidays. So let me start first with congratulations. Are you excited? Nervous? What, how are you feeling about this? You have been working in in the district attorney's office since when? T- tell us all the years that you've been doing this and and how you're feeling today. Yeah, you know, I, I first took the oath of office in February of 86, believe it or not. But that was that's when I joined the Army to, to my parents' great disappointment. Instead of going to medical school, I just enlisted in the Army right after college and then uh, ended up going through officer candidate school, got commissioned in the infantry, did that for about four years. And then that was the end of the Cold War. So I had to figure out what I was going to do next. And that's when I applied to uh, a couple of different law schools, but uh, most importantly, I, I applied to the University of Wisconsin. I was did my undergraduate at Marquette, um, and and then got accepted to UW Madison's law school, and I had GI Bill, which was a big deal, and um, and so I graduated there in '94, and I was hired here, um, you know, right out of law school, and so I've been uh, a prosecutor since 1994, and got elected in 
in uh, 2006 when my predecessor, who was the DA here for 38 years, and he's, of course, the person that hired me, uh, when he retired, um, I, I, I like to say I drew the short straw and uh, ran for <laughs> office the first time. <laughs> John, our similarities run deep, my friend. I, too, was a Marquette undergrad badger for law school. So not are we both lawyers, the tall, goofy looking people and in hoodies. We share a bit of our educational pedigree as well. Um, what what's it, what's your head like right now? Like, what does it feel like after so many years? And just as a point of historical fact, it's really amazing when you combine your tenure plus Mr. E. Michael McCann's tenure. Two of the, in total, I think probably the longest two tenures of DAs in a major U.S. city, um, totaling nearly 69 years uh, of leadership under just two men. So this is an end of an era in a sense. How are you feeling about all this? I feel really, really good about it, primarily because I have such a strong executive team and one of the one of the lessons I learned in the military, right, is is that everybody is is uh, replaceable. Everybody eventually uh, moves on. Sometimes, whether you like it or not, but you have to be prepared for that. So, so you actually develop uh, strong leadership, strong talent. And um, I've I've been most proud of the people that I've been able to bring into this profession, just bring into public service, and just give them the same mandate that I was given, which is hey, you're here to do justice. Do justice to the best of your ability. Don't uh, don't, don't let outside uh, political influences uh, factor in. Just do the right thing to your best, the best of your ability and everything will work out just fine. And I wanted to maintain that culture. I'm confident that it will be maintained um, in, in this office as well. Um, but yeah, it's just a good time. I, 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 a couple different factors. Um, not the least of which uh, are things that impact directly on the county, right? The, finally, the, the state has has given the county some flexibility to address uh, some historic uh, deficits in, in uh, shared revenue funding. Um, I think that's going to help stabilize the support staff. My attorneys are state funded, um, so they recently got a pay raise. I think that's going to help them uh, stabilize. That's been a long-term challenge for me. And then I think we're starting to come out of some of the pandemic-related uh, disruptions and the impacts on the community. And so I'm hopeful, and I've stated a couple times that I, I thought it was going to take us until really about the middle or the end of 24 before the dramatic impacts of uh, 2020, 21, and 22 uh, started unwinding. So I just think this is a good time. 30 years of, of prosecution, about uh, 35 years of public service. It's time for me to just look look towards doing something else. I, I want to keep working. I just don't know what it's going to be right now. Take a brain break. You know, sometimes it's not good <laughs> or it's good to not know what the next thing is so you can warm up to whatever it may be. Certainly, I hope the University of Wisconsin Law School reaches out to you because you would be an incredible asset to help people understand really, truly how the criminal justice system works because it ain't what you read in the books and it sure as heck ain't what you see on the TV. Um, let me ask you sort of the million dollar question, if you will, John, how much did the scandal, if you will, surrounding the gentleman who, uh, killed those folks in, in the Waukesha parade, that, that bail scandal, if you will, factor into it, uh, if at all. And just for folks who don't may not recall this, you, you had a very young prosecutor in your office who did not have effectively the research about um, that particular criminal defendant's uh, criminal past when she uh, had to address a bail hearing that led to his release which then led to the Waukesha parade disaster. Um, she also was in the middle of a huge trial. I respect the heck out of you, John, because you never threw her under the bus and you took accountability for that. Um, what a gift to having a boss that does that. Um, but did that factor in in a direct or indirect way at all in your decision making? You know, it really didn't. The um, the the fact is that that to do this job, you have to accept that in the job of the elected DA, and to a certain extent, any any time you're working as a prosecutor, you just have to accept that you're a decision maker. And 
your decisions have to be guided by principles, by the law, by by ethics. Um, but at the end of the day, whatever decision you make, since it really, I like to describe it as you're you're focusing the lens of state power on somebody. You're 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 potentially going to take somebody's liberty interest away from them, and so it's a big deal. And and you've got to be um, very thoughtful about it. And as a consequence, you also have to be prepared for some level of controversy. And I'll be honest, ever since I've been elected, there's been significant events that have unfolded and have been controversial. Some of them, some of them have received strong support from the public. Some of them have been strongly criticized by the public. But I've always taken the same approach, and that's just to explain why I make my decisions the way I do, what are the underlying principles behind it. And I don't allow um, the, the the fear, the you know, fear of a uh, of uh, say being voted out of office because I make what I think is a principal decision to guide my my decision. So you're always faced with that level of external scrutiny, and at the same time you have to lead an office of of uh, attorneys and support staff, and you have to guide them through these difficult things. So you have to model the whole time that that uh, you're not going to bend to to pressure and. At the same time, you have to stay vigilant the whole time, and so it, it takes its toll. And and I've been I've been uh, pretty much available 24 hours a day now for most of a my long career. time. Yeah, most of my 30 years, I, I respond in person to to every uh, officer involved incident, any critical incident, um, any emergencies that take place, whether it's in the jails or in the in the streets. Um, I'm on call. Pretty much twenty four seven, and um, and that's my that's my. I wouldn't be able to do it any other way. I I just can't imagine not being plugged in a hundred percent of the time and just being responsive and just trying to make sure that we're doing the best we can to serve the community. I hear you, my friend. I didn't quite realize what what I had bitten off when I took my job with Milwaukee County. And that phone rings any time of the day or night. And if it's ringing and it's late, I definitely need to be picking that puppy up. So, and people my, just don't know, right, Maggie? I mean, yes. people people, people kind of lump the the jobs together sometimes, uh, and and uh, people have no clue how much intense pressure um, the the corporation counsel's office and you in particular were. Uh, during the during the recount uh, efforts uh, during the last election and and but that's just that's one of the higher profile ones but but there's just a constant there's there's sort of constant crisis management that takes place uh, if you're if you're doing the job effectively and so that just leads to you, you just have to you have to be invested you have to make sure that you can bring your A game and and that takes its toll. And so that lends into eventually deciding it's in the best interest of everybody to, to develop an exit strategy and, and transition um, peacefully. You know, I'm a big, a big believer in peaceful transitions and not, uh, and not hanging on and trying to, trying to uh, um, overthrow the peaceful transfer of power. Yeah, that's sort of what we would call extrajudicial, right? Not really in accordance with the law uh, to, to, to attack the peaceful transfer of power. I, I hear you. Speaking of elections and peaceful transfers of power, help folks understand, because I don't think many people necessarily think of the district attorney's office's role actually on election day, um, during the RNC, tell folks what your what your office's job is uh, during election time. What what is it that you, your folks are out there doing on on the street on election day and afterwards? You know, this is a commitment I made early on in 2006 when I first ran. Is that is that we would always engage in in a uh, bipartisan collective effort to identify all of the stakeholders in any given election bring them to the table early on and just make sure that everybody knew where they went if there was any kind of problem. Um, I've always had dedicated community partner prosecutors that uh, actually travel uh, out in the community and all they usually do is just stop by and check in with the ward, the, the election captains in the various uh, wards and districts and just check in with them. You got any problems, and you need any help? Um, our investigators are available to respond along with uh, an array of officers from the suburbs, from the city of Milwaukee, from the sheriff's department, from the Division of Criminal Investigation. 
what we really want to do is just be proactive and and address any concerns that, that uh, may arise. We talk to the uh, both campaign uh, legal staffs. We work closely with the courts, and obviously we work closely with with the clerk, uh, the elections commission, and with your office, just to make sure again that everybody knows that that uh, the elections are going to be run fairly. They're going to be run transparently, and if there is a problem, there there will be an accountability for that. It's it's such an incredibly important uh, function that is totally invisible to 99% of folks, and that is um, that your office and police departments, if if someone's observing a polling place, and we allow campaign, we allow partisan observers, we've got nonpartisan, they have a number that gets disseminated. Folks can call if they think something is amiss, and your lawyers and law enforcement will show up. Um, and here's what uh, the punchline I'm going to leave folks with if we, as we go to this quick uh, break. I'll ask you to stick around for another segment if I can take 10 more minutes of your time, John. It's so you important bet. to talk to you. But um, legitimately, there are problems. Law enforcement and district attorneys show up. And guess what, folks? There are so very few of those problems in Wisconsin elections and in Milwaukee County. We run elections efficiently, safely, transparently, and everybody and their uncle has their nose under the tent. It is all out in public. You can see it. You can feel it. You can touch it. You can see the sausage being made. I am talking to current Milwaukee County District Attorney John Chisholm here on this very cold Monday edition of the Maggie Dawn Show. Keep it locked. More with John in just a minute after these important messages. Welcome back, everybody. You are listening to a very cold MLK Monday edition of the Maggie Dawn Show with my producer and friend, Anya Esther. Give us a call for the last segment of the day if you'd like to have, if you got a question for outgoing Milwaukee County District Attorney John Chisholm. John, thanks again for being here during the break. I was telling you, I wanted to ask you about this very real phenomenon that happens in your job, especially you're way more visible than I am in my nine to five capacity, but boy, we get it from the left. We get it from the progressives. We get it from the right and the conservatives and we've got the middle and people may or may not understand all the elements of the job, but you kind of, the way I joke about it is I'm probably not doing my job right. If somebody's not ticked off at me most of the time, tell us a little bit about that element of doing such a public high profile gig. So when I'm talking to young law students, I actually talk philosophy once in a while, believe it or not. And what was the uh, classic uh, Aristotelian definition of justice? It was the balance between extremes, right? And there is no position in um, American culture, history, um, uh, just the, the reality of how we maintain our social compact where the the role of the prosecutor isn't elevated and it's a unique role you go around the country i'll have delegations come from uh, other other uh, parts of the world and when they hear that you're an elected prosecutor 
they, uh, that just blows their mind. Um, and then when you tell them, yeah, not only that, but it's it's in a partisan election, they're they're just like, how can you possibly do that? And and the reality is, the only way you can do it is if you have that steadfast commitment to doing justice and doing it in a principled way. And and yes, you have to run um, as as a as a elected official. And yes, you run with a party. And and you should be able to represent the the highest aspirations of that party without any difficulty whatsoever. But at the end of the day, it then becomes a very professional job that has to be done a certain way. And so almost by definition, you're going to be pushed to, to do something from the left or from the right. And at the end of the day, your obligation is, again, to maintain that social compact and and to balance the two extremes. I tell everybody, look, uh, I, I have to I have to not only keep people safe, but I have to do it in a way that respects and elevates their constitutional liberties. That's what makes this job unique. It, it would be really easy if I just, I'm just going to be tough on crime, whatever, whoever gets arrested under whatever circumstances, we just charge it. Uh, we don't look at whether it was, uh, it was uh, legitimate by the Fourth Amendment or anything like that. We just charge everything and let God sort it out. That's not a professional prosecutor's job. A, a professional prosecutor has to make sure that people's civil liberties are, are respected and honored. And at the same time, you have to keep the community safe when people break that social compact. So that tension's built into it. And that's quite frankly what makes the job just so phenomenal and exciting and fun. Yeah, it, it's an interesting challenge to face every day because the circumstances that you have to apply that fundamental principle to are constantly changing and evolving. Um, what do you think uh, Milwaukee County voters can expect for the district attorney election? We know that your deputy, Kent Lovern, has declared, I, I can't see that there won't be a number of people that end up throwing their hats in the ring. This could be quite a bruiser, don't you think, John? So the way I look at it is I can only put it in the historical context is that when uh, E. Michael McCann um, didn't run, the, the the same thought was that you would get just, you know, after 38 years, you'd have tons of people uh, enter it. And as it turned out, I think there was about three three declared candidates. One ran as an independent and uh, one dropped out early. The other I had a primary with, and then I went to a general uh, with the independent. And um, all I can say about it is that experience I thought was invaluable. It was invaluable mm -hmm. for, for me to, to be able to draw connections and relationships in the community that I never would have had in any other circumstance. And then the other aspect of it is I was able to to make certain promises to the community that if they trusted me with the position that I do everything in my power to implement uh, some of those core core things that I believe needed to be done to make a, a better criminal justice system and to keep the community safe and to make it healthier. And so doing that means that you, you get locked in, right? I mean, rightfully so, you get locked into yeah. trying to implement the things that you've promised to do. I think that the same thing is going to happen here. I, I obviously there's there's usually two ways that these things go. There's there's the external kind of hostile takeover, or there's the internal person who continues a continues a legacy and tradition. I was the internal candidate who who continued the legacy and took it off in different directions. I'm hopeful that the same thing happens. I say that because I, I think that there's a real benefit to to some levels of continuity. No matter what, whoever takes over next has to take it in their own unique directions and do it their own way. But as long as the core remains the same, and which is that every person that's ever worked here has been told the exact same thing for the last 50, 60 years, and that is you're here to do justice, you're here to do the right thing, you're to the very best of your ability, you're, you're here to make sure that the right thing is done, um, and whatever that right thing is requires a lot of uh, using your head, using your heart, um, and and being really committed to this community. Well, John, my thanks to you for your time this this evening, but most importantly, John, Milwaukee County is better because of you. Um, it certainly has been a privilege and honor, a great highlight of my career to get to work alongside of you for these past few years at Milwaukee County. My best, my congratulations. Why don't you come back and do this again in a, in a couple of months as things start to heat up because this was a bunch of fun. Thanks so much, John. That's you. it for 
Th- Thank you, Maggie. So I really appreciate it. It's been an honor. Truly. That's it for this Monday edition of the Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. We'll be back with more tomorrow. You're not going to want uh, want to miss it. Stay warm out there and take care of each other, folks. Now I hear the sound of sirens Knifing through the gloom They don't know what they are doing They can hardly understand